200 years ago, on the 7th of October, 1818, Dorothy Wordsworth made her ascent of Scarfell Pike. So that's why we're looking at re... We're trying to think of a way of describing it, because it's not, it's not recreating it, because it's more than that. Um, I thought it was re-being the walk. Um, re-being... doing the walk, climbing Scaffell Pike. Um, and this is part of a greater project run by the Wordsworth Trust called Reimagining Wordsworth. So that's not... Um, not just recreating. But having another think about it, you know, how else can we look at it? What else can we do with all this? Let's do some imagining here. I'm Alex. Some might say I'm an artist. I paint, I go outdoors, I sing, I write music, I work with horses, and I read a lot. Before I started with this project, I knew of Dorothy as the sister of William Wordsworth, that she wrote herself, um, and she lived in Grasmere, and that she walked a lot. Dorothy Wordsworth made her an ascent of Scarfell Pike, and she wrote about it in a letter. Now, women didn't generally climb up mountains, um, even women from a fairly privileged background like Dorothy was. And then when she wrote about it in a letter, the letter was then published by Wordsworth without attributing it, attributing it to Dorothy. So her letter was the first written account of climbing Scaffell Pike, um, and it was by a woman, even though most people think it was William he was supposed to be the first, one of the first people to write about climbing Scarfell Pike. And it was actually um, a woman who did it. I did read about a young man who started a walk to Canterbury to address his depression and anxiety. And I wonder if Dorothy, who spent so much time cooking, cleaning, looking after others, and suffering from depression and headaches if her four-hour daily walks were part of her medicine. Because when you're out here, all that other stuff just goes. I was doing some sessions with the with our Alzheimer's Society, which is supported by the Wordsworth Trust. Um, and whenever we do those sessions, we usually have some readings from Dorothy's journals. Um, and literally, I just had the idea, I just thought, I wonder what I would do if I went round dressed as Dorothy and saw what she saw, and um, where, go where she went and looked at the same mountains and felt the same weather, because I do landscapes anyway. And I'm always kind of interested in other people's stories, so I thought that might be a bit of a, a bit of an idea. And so I've been walking where she walked, looking at what she looked at. Um, we've got a costume as well. I'm going to be doing a, a big costumed walk as well. Women were not supposed to go around bareheaded, so she'd have had a bonnet on. But if you wear a bonnet. It, you, your ears are covered and suddenly you can't hear and then your eye, your, your vision is restricted. So if you've got this kind of almost helmet, I suppose, restricting your vision and covering your ears, how would she have seen all the things that she saw that she wrote about? And she talked about her senses getting really heightened and I completely understand that. So I came up with this idea of postcards in that every time I do a walk, at the end of the walk, over a coffee, I will draw or paint a little postcard 
that's of an aspect of the walk and a thought that I've had whilst I've been doing that walk I'll write on the back of the postcard. Um, the postcards are going to people who who want them so I put out online this is what I want to do let me know if you want a postcard and I've had lots of responses and the idea is these postcards are then off they go with their stamp on them to someone else who then receives an image that I've done and they have a thought that I've had and they now have it it's theirs. I mean one of the things I do like is this idea of coming across the, the gift of economy with creativity how you share your creativity with someone else and you bounce off each other, which gives you new ideas. So that's the reason you're doing it. And one of the reasons Dorothy wrote her journal is because she was doing it for her brother. And I then wonder what kind of journal she'd have written if she did it for herself, because she's doing it for an audience. So it's gonna be quite different than if she did it for herself. The plan was to rewalk the same route as Dorothy and Mary had done um, in full period costume, five of us, um, myself as Dorothy, Harriet Fraser as Mary Barker, Dr Joe Taylor as trusted maid Agnes, Paul Davies taking the role of the porter and Paul Westover as the shepherd. We set off, um, the sun was shining, uh, we were all kind of really excited. Adrenaline was really up because we were starting on this huge. We, were re we it was now, you know, it wasn't. Um, it was something that we'd been planning for over a year, and now we were doing it. I was very aware of doing the walk to the to the minute, not just two hundred years to the day, but to the minute, because we set off at the same time. We departed before nine o'clock. The sun shone. The sky was clear and blue and light and shade fell in masses upon the mountains. The fields below glittered with the dew where the beams of the sun could reach them, and every little stream tumbling down the hills seemed to add to the cheerfulness of the scene. In her letter, Dorothy was talking about how easy this, the walk was being. Um, the weather was wonderful, um, they were enjoying the views, um, she felt fit and full of vigour, even though I think she was about 46. She was really fe feeling really blessed that she was still so fit and healthy and able to do these walks. So we, we sat where we think she probably would have sat. 200 years probably to the minute and that again is a bit special and they would have sat and looked at the waterfall and they because it's a lovely place to spot and you can look back down the valley so rather than go back to the path and follow the path with well let's clamber up the waterfall that'll be a bit of fun we decided it was it was time to put on some better clothes because um we knew that there was going to be some weather coming in. And as we came just over the ridge of the hill, there's a huge cloud that's just blowing, well, racing, racing across, it's blowing up through the halls. And I was very relieved when I was told, we just go down there a little bit and we're going to get, there's a shelter. We had lunch. Um, and we took a little bit of time out to kind of regroup and have a think about what we're going to do. This is where Dorothy and Mary was intending to go. They weren't intending to go any further. We had attained the object of our journey, but our ambition mounted higher. We saw the summit of Scorfell, as it seemed very near to us. We were indeed three parts up that mountain, and thither we determined to go. I was half hoping everybody would want to go home at this point because that wind was something else. People had given me things they wanted me to say to commemorate people that they'd lost and that was incredibly hard, really hard. Sorry, still hard. <laughs> 
I was told afterwards that the wind dropped when I did it, which was really strange. And it kind of gives you that sense of this mountain, it almost has a personality because it, it kind of brings things and does things and there's kind of like a performance going on. Meanwhile, the air changed to cold and we saw that the tiny vapour swelled into mighty masses of cloud which came boiling over the mountains. Great Gable, Helvellyn and Skiddor were wrapped in storm. We decided we were going to carry on. Um, we were now going to aim for the pike. I was kind of dreading this because the weather now had really come in. The wind was very, very strong. We, we now started to think about whether it was going to be sensible to really aim for the pike. We did have some very experienced mountaineers in the party. The general opinion was it's possible. We're about an hour and a quarter away. Shall we do it or not? And I remember asking Jay Gore, what do you think? And he said, um, it's possibly doable, but we could get into trouble. Uh, that's it. I said, no, we, we don't. There's no way we should be trying to do anything that might get us into trouble, because I thought that was just going to be too dangerous. Even though I was kind of really disappointed as well, because I was extremely tired by now, but I, I kind of wanted to do it because I've been so determined to do it, but safety has to come first. And then there was a real relief that we weren't going to do it. And I remember um, Richard saying, the view will be the same that it is from here, <laughs> which is just grey. thought, OK, I'm not going to see anything special. So we decided to head for Ill Crag instead. Uh, and there is a photograph of us sort of clambering around, the, the, sit, standing at the top of the crag, trying to look cheerful, because we, we got as far as we could go. But it was, it was a sensible decision. Um, and then it was a case of turning around and heading for home. These paintings for me are about the ex very much about the experience. So in some ways I want people to see them and um, get a sense of what it was I was experiencing and what I'm trying to say. Even though I've done this project and we've got to here, I feel like I've just started. I haven't really, it's not the end for me, it's, it's a beginning. It's like, okay, that was the introduction. I would like people to be um, inspired by this project. I would like people to go out into the mountains with the right clothes on. I would like people to think a little bit about their place in the world and on the planet. Um, I would like people to connect with each other because that was a really strong part of the walk for me was, was making all the connections with the people. We started off as a group of people that knew each other a bit and by the end we felt we'd been through some momentous event together which brings you all an awful lot closer. Mm -hmm.